Hi everyone and welcome to another interview in my series of face-to-face uh, -face fundraising in times of the coronavirus. I'm very happy to have another guest here um, and well, I mean, he is one of the masters when it comes to face-to-face -face fundraising. Um, you are in face-to-face -face fundraising for, I don't know how long exactly, but we'll ask him, Daryl Absel. <laughs> Hi, welcome. Hi, Anne. Great. Thanks for inviting me today. Thanks for your time and uh, thanks for, yeah, I mean, yeah, our chat about face-to-face -face fundraising, if it is worth to speak about face-to-face -face fundraising. So what do you think? Is this the end of face-to-face -face fundraising? Well, there's a thought. I've been involved in face-to-face -face fundraising since, I guess, 1997, 98, when we okay. co-invented it with mm -hmm. Greenpeace in Austria. So I'm kind of the old man of face-to-face. -face. I even had hair when it started. <laughs> Quite as much hair as you, but that's something else. And the funny thing is, is even in the days of Greenpeace by the year 2000, we were talking about, is it the end of face-to-face? All right. What's going to come afterwards? We were doing product life cycle analysis and mm -hmm. how do we change face to face so it can survive another five years? And then I guess I've been in the debates through the nine, through the 2000s about the economic crisis. Oh my God, that's the end of face to face. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? The economic crisis was the biggest boom year for face to face ever. Okay. Not just for many agencies that were there still, but also for the non-profits. Mm -hmm. Why was that? We could employ more people, better people. The marketplace was not so tough to get people to work. And those in work felt very grateful for the situation. Mm -hmm. So now we're in our next crisis. And, and it's my second pandemic because I worked through the HIV AIDS pandemic. Okay. As well. I was one of the first fundraisers in that. And yes, face to face is almost halted as we talk today mm -hmm. but it's not totally halted mm -hmm. it's still active in asia there are still teams in hong kong there's still teams in and out of singapore in and out of thailand that have okay. been coming back and forth um into the market during this crisis with permissions mm -hmm. and safety concerns fully taken into account it's not the end of face to face i think it is the next morphing and if you like, re-emergence of face-to-face post-crisis. Okay, let's talk about the, how face-to-face -face fundraising will look like in the month to come after we've all, well, come through this crisis. But there might be some people uh, that don't know you. Um, um, and yeah, I mean, let's give them a few information about your person because you're not only like the face-to-face -face, a face-to-face -face fundraising pioneer but um, also a lot of people maybe know you from the job postings but that's not only what you're doing so what, what okay. is the universum of Daryl Absol? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh um, well I've been in fundraising for 36 years I'm probably one of the few fundraisers who started working for a revolution mm -hmm. so I started working for the San and Easter Revolution as a fundraiser in mm -hmm. the early 1980s. And since I've worked in development aid issues, I was the pioneer f fundraising person in Europe, professional for HIV AIDS in the mm -hmm. 90s. Mm -hmm. Created the largest HIV AIDS organization in the world as a result. Wow. And then I went on to head a small little known organization globally called Greenpeace. You may have heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and ran the fundraising there for seven years. And it was during that time that we pioneered face-to-face. -face. And the interesting thing is we pioneered it in answer to my boss at the time, Dr. Tilo Bode, mm -hmm. who said, Dara, we are becoming gray peace. Our supporters are so old, we are not bringing in young people. Mm -hmm. And he was right. Because in those days, the average age of a Greenpeace supporter in Europe certainly was in their 60s and even 70s, we were not the young, vibrant organization. Face-to-face, mm. -face, as pioneered, tested, and then rolled out around the world, starting from Vienna, was our answer to addressing the issue of becoming Greenpeace again with mm -hmm. green shoots instead of gray peace. <laughs> and it was successful, and we failed at mm -hmm. the same time. So you, you, you were successful and you failed. You need to explain this Absolutely. a bit more. <laughs> Because we were successful at recruiting um, 
many young new donors. Okay. We were successful at signing them up on the streets. They were engaged. They were young fundraisers signing them up. And we did two things that were wrong. Firstly, we assumed that they would love direct mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, not many 18-year-olds, 19, 20-year-olds <laughs> like direct mail, <laughs> even back in 1998. <laughs> um, so as soon as we started direct mailing them, they stopped being interested in Greenpeace. Okay. The other thing we realized, of course, is 18-year-olds back in the late 90s, certainly, didn't have very much money. Mm -hmm. So those standing orders, direct debits, they kept failing. Mm -hmm. So we had huge levels of attrition. So one of the things we really had to do in that period is reevaluate, actually, who should we be recruiting? Okay how young and it clearly wasn't 18 years old mm -hmm. um, it was more like 25 plus as we discovered over the years and furthermore we realized they needed a whole different communications trail and way mm -hmm. of stewardship that was totally different to those direct mail recruited mm -hmm. donors mm -hmm. and that's when actually i would say telephone started to be a really key part of the fundraising mix okay mm -hmm. So oh, as, it, as it's grown, you'll see face-to-face -face and telephone are completely hand-in-hand, -hand, mm -hmm. and one cannot work without the other. Yeah. And I mean, face-to-face -face fundraising a few months before um, was still, or is still, was uh, the, the, one of the most important tools to get new donors on board for uh, a lot of charities. Um, so... And it fall down from zero, 100 to zero uh, when, when Corona and isolation and all this stuff started. Will it be back again? What do you think? I think when you look at where we started 2020, mm -hmm. you have to really start looking at where in the world you start 2020 as well. Mm -hmm. If you were starting 2020 in the United Kingdom, you might say face-to-face -face was already in a crisis situation that began a few years ago. Okay. Thanks to some negative publicity, this term you may have heard of, charity chuggers. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, charities spending anything between five to even one client, 25 years, return on investment period. Well, That's mm -hmm. a tool in crisis. Mm -hmm. It didn't have to be in crisis, but it mm -hmm. was through a series of, I would say, failures, mismanagements, and not keeping the eye on the ball. Okay. If, on the other hand, you started in Thailand or Taiwan, you would be seeing it as still the most vibrant, powerful fundraising tool on the planet, mm -hmm. which nothing else could touch in terms of cost-effectiveness, return on investment. Mm -hmm. So in terms of where it was in the world, or if you're in the USA, I speak a lot in the USA. We've ourselves met each other a few times at conferences in mm -hmm. the USA. Mm -hmm. You talk about face-to-face -face fundraising and they go, oh, you mean major donors? No. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. No, you sign people up and collect cash? No. Mm -hmm. You know, even though face-to-face -face has been in the USA now for 20 years, thanks to Greenpeace originally, if you speak in Dallas, Texas as I did at the fundraising conference, the AFP last year okay. at the time. In fact, nobody knew what face-to-face -face fundraising was. Oh, wow. 400 okay. attendees at a mm -hmm. major conference there. Mm -hmm. So where was face-to-face? -face? Highly sophisticated in some markets, okay. basic in others, non-existent in others. So mm -hmm. if you want to really know, face-to-face -face was shifting itself around the world at okay. this point in time, prior, mm -hmm. pre-COVID-19. Mm-hmm. But regarding now to uh, coronavirus, so it really has, has an impact on face-to-face on -face fundraising. And I'm really wondering, so because when I look at myself, I'm, when I look outside now and I see more than five people uh, gathering there, I have a bit fear, oh, isn't it enough? Or, or uh, well, that, that there shouldn't be more people. And so I, I already feel like, Maybe I have a little problem with myself already, getting more in closer contact with other people. Although at the same time, I really miss it to hug someone. But uh, let's yeah. not talk about me, but let's talk about face-to-face -face fundraising again. So I, 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 I'm, I hardly have an idea of how will uh, a fundraiser on the street will get a signature from a person, um, from a new donor. Well, there's two things. One is... 
signature what's that it's almost mm -hmm. as archaic as asking them to write a check isn't it <laughs> <laughs> i mean let's be frank uh -huh. you know, I, I spend quite some time in the in recent years in china and i take out my chinese cell phone okay. to show them my you know, social media apps and i have people going ha, 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 ha. <laughs> this man has a piece of antique furniture in his hand <laughs> okay. where is your cat that pays mm -hmm. you back that does you this that is everything all rolled into one mm -hmm. so yeah, already in the technological sense, there was mm -hmm. no need for paper touching. Um, yeah, things could be done through near field communication, through people's own cell phones. The technological solutions are all there and, mm -hmm. and actually working well in many cases and will be certainly having a, a boost when face to face fundraising comes back into play mm -hmm. in the larger markets. But here's the thing talking to my colleagues who work running the face-to-face -face or Save the Children Globally or UNICEF or WWF or any of the other large international organizations. Mm -hmm. I think we share the same view. Face-to-face -face fundraisers are outgoing, ebullient, enthusiastic people who are storing up so much energy while they're not working mm -hmm. that they'll be more enthusiastic than ever. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, those face-to-face -face fundraisers who are still on the payroll, shall we say, They've been recommissioned for a period into becoming telephone fundraisers. They're oh, doing yeah, enhanced yeah. training. They're getting deep dive uh, inductions into the programmatic side mm -hmm. of the organization, whether that's virtually visiting refugee camps, having chats with wildlife conservationists in the jungle, mm -hmm. and you know, really getting into the cause. So okay. whereas in the past there was never time for training, mm -hmm. now they're highly trained. Mm -hmm. They're motivated. Now look at the other side of the mirror. The public, ourselves included, have been locked in our spaces, mm -hmm. desperate for some social intercourse that's not through a video screen. Yeah. And in fact, may well welcome that conversation face to face with another human being. Mm -hmm. Even if it's maybe behind a protective shield to begin with a mask and maybe they're wearing gloves. Mm -hmm. And knowing face to faces, even those masks, gloves and and shields will be creative and fun. Yeah, I, I just, just learned. Yeah, <laughs> I just learned that uh, there there are some markets already reopened for face to face fundraising, right? Like yeah. South Korea. Um, uh, what else? Singapore's been Singapore, opened. Hong yes. Kong. So, have you? Um, do you do do you know how they are working now? So, how they are protecting? What are the security standards uh, for the for the fundraisers? I think all of the above protective stuff's been going on. I think, to be frank, it's not that successful simply because there aren't okay. so many people on the streets anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but they're there. So I'm, I think actually judging much from what they're currently doing is not necessarily the best way. Okay. Having said that, I've, I was just off a call a moment ago from the CEO of the Austrian Fundraising Association. Mm -hmm. They have created health guidelines for the return of face-to-face -face mm -hmm. in the streets and in the malls and everything of, of Austria. Mm -hmm. They've taken the best medical advice they can from Asia, from the organizations in the field currently, from WHO. They're working mm -hmm. with the Austrian Health Ministry. They want their guidelines even to be approved by the Austrian government relevant authorities mm -hmm. that they have gone to the very highest levels of compliance. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure, you know, probably the pioneering work done by the Austrian Fundraising Association And something that I've been encouraging the international nonprofits to do is a, a joint global communication strategy about face-to-face -face mm -hmm. and what it means when we come back to market to make sure that A, people are properly prepared mm -hmm. physically that, and the messaging to the public is clear, transparent and focuses on the safety element of the conversation. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not going to be returned to normal in the near future. No. It will be returned to a new normal. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And can we have uh, switched the spotlight onto the uh, NGOs, like charities? Yeah. So because now we were speaking a lot about the, the perspective of, uh, I mean, the face-to-face the, 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 the -face agencies, the fundraisers on the streets. But uh, 
do, do you also saw or see like organizations who are, I mean, like quitting their, um, their, their contracts with agencies? So do they still believe in the, in the in face to face fundraising or uh, what, what are your observations? Interesting perspective, because you assumed I was talking about agencies in my previous conversation. <laughs> Those are largely the in-house teams of the large right. organizations like UNICEF, UNHCR, et cetera, et cetera, because okay. in many markets, the capacity of the agencies is not big enough to fulfill the demands and needs. Mm -hmm. So they have a combination of in-house and outsourced mm -hmm. agent face-to-face. Uh, -face. Okay. Clearly, they have little or no control on the outsourced mm -hmm. agencies. But having said that, they've been extremely generous and kind. In Spain, we work for pretty much most of the large NGOs with our face-to-face -face agency, mm -hmm. international fundraising. And they've come to agreements that allow us to furlough our staff and not bankrupt the company instantly mm -hmm. by not being able to produce. Mm -hmm. Because they know when the, the all clear or part clear is given, they want us to bounce back and deliver new monthly donors to them. Mm -hmm. So... One, I think it has changed the trust levels between the agencies and the nonprofits, be they mm -hmm. UN agencies, charities, or Red Cross, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Changed the way in which the agency, the nonprofits are working with their in house teams. Mm -hmm. So they've managed to, as I mentioned earlier, re remodel their, their yeah. them into telephoners i know some organizations have their face-to-faces using social media okay. to actually reach out through social media they're using face-to-face -face fundraisers to telephone people just for the touch points to mm -hmm. say thank you to build mm -hmm. loyalty during the crisis so that's one thing in terms of the agencies and i say agencies in both terms in terms of the non-profits the mm -hmm. un the charities the you know, big multinationals the msfs the save the children the mm -hmm. they are doing a great deal to make sure face-to-face -face really bounces back and i speak to the leaders of those organizations and they are totally fired up to go back to market okay yeah, yeah. Because, well, I mean, yes, they, they need the income, right? Because there are organizations uh, getting 90% of their income through face-to-face -face fundraising. Uh, so what could... 90% of their new donors, not their yeah. income. Yeah. Or, or they are their new donors, yeah. Sorry. The good thing is, yeah. 90% of their income may have come from those from, from face -to -face recruited face -to -face donors fundraising. Yeah, yeah. recruited over the last 20 years. Yeah. yeah. I spoke um, in total to six different people uh, from the from the face-to-face -face fundraising uh, area market, and all of them very optimistic um, that face-to-face -face fundraising will have a great future. Yeah. Yeah, that uh, feels good. Yeah, I, I think it's going to change a few things. The technology, as we mentioned, will move on. Mm -hmm. The initial issues around safety and health will be there for as long as we are living with this coronavirus, COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But I think some other things may well change. There may be less obsession, I would say, with volume, which mm -hmm. has been a mistake for me in face-to-face -face in recent years. Once the UK market was hitting 800,000 new monthly donors a year through face-to-face, Mm -hmm. You can be assured that the quality had gone down at mm -hmm. the margins. Mm -hmm. You can be assured there'll be bad apples, not such good companies in that process that needed shifting out. Mm -hmm. And certainly one of the things we worked with our clients in, in Spain on our face-to-face -face last year was if we want a good volume, but not a crazy volume, let's go for higher value donors, better mm -hmm. levels of donor loyalty, and not have this obsession about as many donors as cheap as possible as we can get. Mm -hmm. And I think as we come out, that's going to be a focus. Mm -hmm. Another thing that's going to happen, as happened in 2008, is for, sadly for the wrong reasons, because people will have lost their jobs in other areas of business. Companies in the hospitality sector, mm -hmm. for example, will have lost staff. Very sociable, very outgoing people we will have a lot better chance of recruiting really dynamic, infused people into the face-to-face -face mm -hmm. teams, whether they're an agency or a charity. Mm -hmm. That will give a, a re-energization, I think, to the, to the sector. Right. So I'm fundamentally optimistic. 
And the other thing I'd add is I think this time has also shifted resources to look mm -hmm. more at how does the telephone work? Mm -hmm. Even during this, are we going to be recruiting donors or just saying thank you to donors to keep them mm -hmm. with us during the mm -hmm. COVID crisis? Digital socials on the, on the rise massively. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing in the Dach German speaking countries, massive increase in inquiries for legacy. So mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. saying, how can I leave a legacy? You, mm -hmm. In Germany, at least there is specific legislation that almost drives that. If I yeah. die without a will, the state might get my, my assets. Mm -hmm. And direct response TV mm -hmm. is having its boom period because guess what? The corporate sector does not yeah, want sure. to advertise products that you can't go to a shop and buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So more people watching like, yeah, all the DRTV spots. At, at a lower cost per acquisition for the organizations. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not competing with, sadly, holidays in Spain or <laughs> BMWs made in Germany yeah. or, for that matter, Swiss chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe Swiss chocolate still. Uh, okay. That's <laughs> probably having a boom during the crisis. <laughs> But then, um, you know, that space is available to buy at a cheaper price or mm -hmm. even pro bono we've heard in some cases mm -hmm. for nonprofits. So okay. in many ways, it's kind of making this, the fundraising mix mm -hmm. more spread. And I mm -hmm. think post the crisis, I think organizations will think more about putting all their, as we say in English, eggs into one basket. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Well, Daryl, it was a great uh, trip with you around uh, the globe uh, of face-to-face -face fundraising. As and not only around the globe, but also two different fundraising uh, uh, instruments um, that uh, will be affected by yeah. the reopening of face-to-face -face fundraising, as you said. Absolutely. Thank you very much. These are challenging times, but mm -hmm. every challenge is an opportunity. And I think... What I love about fundraising in my 36 years in this sector through various crises is that we are resilient, but more importantly, we are highly creative as yeah. a sector. That's and nice. we will come through it stronger, more together, funny enough. If I see cooperation between nonprofits, between agencies, mm -hmm. and I think better faced, better place to face the future. Wow. I take this as our last word. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you very greetings much. from Zurich to you in your house. And, uh, and see greetings you. from Spain to your listeners. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Daryl. See you. Bye-bye.